Yeah. There we there go. There you go. Hi, everybody. Well, welcome back from um, our lunch break. I uh, hope you had a good uh, break and digested everything that uh, you learned so far. And today, or well, today in this session, we have James Brockbank. He is the managing director of a digital loft UK based EO company. Yeah. Um, he'll share with us a, a proven blueprint for a scalable content strategy. Basically, he'll share with us ideas and how he scaled uh, one of his clients' businesses, which is fantastic, amazing. We all, you know, we're all in this content marketing yeah. game, and <laughs> it's interesting to uh listen obviously from you know from the uh, from experts in the industry uh, i'm excited to listen and, and learn from from james um before we start before i give the stage to james uh two things our our partner our um, sponsor is packed they're giving away an ebook uh, they're giving 20 ebooks away you can get uh, you can win the ebook by engaging with us uh, by asking questions and you'll get one of the ebooks, which is AI powered commerce. So basically, if you're interested in building products or services uh, for the future, the ebook will help you. Um, we'll have um, we'll have the talk, and then we'll have Q and A. Um, so James, welcome, and the stage is yeah. yours. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much for uh, yeah for for having me. Okay. So. My name is James Brockbank. I'm managing director and founder of an SEO and content agency over in the UK called Digital Loft. And today I'm going to talk about scalable content strategies. But actually to do that, I want to talk you through how we took a site from nothing, a brand new site on a brand new domain from launch from zero to 300,000 monthly organic sessions in just eight months. When we're talking scalable strategies, we're talking rapid growth. We're talking what can you do and how can you approach organic to drive that accelerated growth for, in some cases, a new business, sometimes an established business, but actually the principles are the same. So to jump straight into the results, I'm keen that, you know, I want to be very, very transparent here, talking through exactly what we did, how we did it and what the results were. You can see here taken from SEMrush that in just eight months, we're seeing an estimated visibility on Google in the US of just over 230,000 hits per month. Actually, when we go to analytics, we're actually seeing that already in March, we've hit 307,000 sessions on this site. You can see the month on month growth. In my sort of 13, 14 year SEO career, this is probably the fastest growth I've seen, which is almost that perfect growth graph to the right that we all want to see. And actually, then when we sort of break this down a little more, we can see that actually the drivers behind this are rankings for over 140,000 keywords with over 3,000 top three positions in eight months. So. What are we talking about here? Well, the site that we're referencing here is a site called the Family Vacation Guide. This is essentially a, a guide, a resource to help families plan and book vacations targeting the US market. And why I wanted to talk about this project in particular today was that it allows us to dispel the myth and it shows that SEO doesn't have to take that assumed six to 12 months to drive success. With the right strategy in place, utilizing a scalable content framework, you can shave many, many months off that so-called sandbox period, that assumed time to rank and drive growth. But actually what's very, very interesting here is when we start to punch into, here they address some of the keywords that this site is ranking for, so we can see we take the number one position for water park resorts in Florida. Key destination, key search query, high sort of booking intent. We're ranking in that number one position with the lowest domain rating on the front page of the SERPs. Look at another example, which is actually a more generic family all-inclusive resorts. We're ranking in position three, but we're above beaches. We're above 
many, many sort of high authority established, high domain rating established sites. And what I want to talk about is how, how is this possible for a site that's just eight months old, able to outrank some long established sites with a much greater level of domain rating, domain authority. So I first want to address this sort of concept of scalable strategies. Now, when we talk about scalability, when we talk about scaling content and search strategies, really what we're asking is how can we significantly increase the output from a small increase to our inputs? In reality, this means we have to work smarter, not harder. We have to find what works and double down on that. We have to design processes that allow us to scale. It's not about cutting corners. It absolutely isn't. It's about finding efficient ways of doing tasks, of scaling things up. And then it's about knowing where to prioritize efforts to drive the quickest and biggest wins. I'm a big, big believer in SEO that one of the most common reasons why SEO strategies fail to deliver is a lack of prioritization. Knowing where to focus what's, let's face it, always limited resources. We'd all like more resources, whatever project we're on. Where do you prioritize and focus those to see the biggest wins? But the other thing I want to touch on before we dive into the what we did and how we achieved this growth is talking about topical authority. So topical authority, as far as I'm concerned, is all about building that expertise, demonstrating to the search engines that you are that topical expert. But actually, the reasons why you have to and should care about topical authority is that when you build this so-called authority, when your site is seen as an authority on a topic, you can actually forget about keyword difficulty. You can stop worrying about that. You can stop feeling intimidated by higher domain authority or domain rating sites, as I've just demonstrated. You can rank new content faster with fewer links. And you can own the search for topics, not just single keywords. Topical authority for almost any site, whether it's B2B, B2C, e-commerce, lead generation, affiliate, topical authority can be your competitive advantage. And in many ways, we can break this down to being all about creating content that deserves to rank at the top of the SERPs. Over the sort of 13, 14 years that I've been working in SEO, the channel has evolved significantly from something that was seen as a manipulative tactic, a bit of a, you know, cut corners to drive that growth to a mature marketing technique. And actually, the fast track to SEO success, as far as I'm concerned, is to actually create that result that deserves to rank. We shouldn't be going in with an approach on, you know, how can we scale and drive growth to subpar content, content that isn't as good as a competitor. When we deserve to rank, we usually will. So, I want to dive into certainly what we see on this project. What drives organic growth in 2022? And if we break down the sort of three key silos of almost all SEO activity, we can break that down to content, links, and technical SEO. Now, my honest opinion is that for most businesses, technical SEO is not a growth driver. And what I mean by that is technical SEO is in many cases fixing problems that exist, fixing issues that with the site being able to be crawled, being able to be indexed. Now, that puts you on a level play field. That allows you to rank. But actually, the key growth drivers for most businesses are going to be content and links. Don't get me wrong. If you have technical issues, they absolutely have to be sorted. But in terms of the activity to actively drive growth, it's almost always content and links. So when we look at what drives SEO success right now, we can see four key things. So the first one, as I briefly touched on, is building topical authority. You need to position yourself as the best resource on the web or the best result to answer a searcher's query. 
but also the velocity of content that's published. I've got some stats on actually what we did here to come very, very soon. But we need to approach this with the mindset of you can't rank for a query until you've got content that aligns to this. The more I've got that high quality content you publish, the faster you'll grow. I often hear that agencies or in-house teams have been publishing two, three, four pieces of content a month. That's not going to drive growth. I'm going to share some numbers about the velocity that we published here. We did not cut corners. This is all great, high-quality content. Yes, there was a significant investment made into this, but it's delivered. And we'll talk about velocity a little later on. A well-structured site. Now, this might often go without saying, but actually when we work with sort of businesses that have been around some time, I would say in eight out of 10 instances, the site structure has huge opportunities for improvement. And actually one of the quickest wins here is to implement a smart internal linking strategy to actually demonstrate the topical connection between two or more pieces of content. And then lastly, authority relevant links. Links are still a key growth driver in SEO. I honestly don't see that going away anytime soon. Yes, for many years, we've had people saying link building dead, you can rank without links. The reality is that most businesses can't unless they already have a very, very established link profile. But actually, we need to think about link building as more than just an SEO tactic and something that passes SEO benefit. Link building should be approached uh, very much in the mindset of what can we do to amplify this business, get this business, this website in front of a key target audience and earn links as a byproduct of doing so. So actually, what I really want to share and where we can really dive in and hopefully you guys can learn, hopefully see, you know, see what we did, is talking you through the process we followed. This was all about creating a scalable content blueprint that we can utilize month after month to scale the growth of this site. And perhaps no surprise, it all starts with keyword research. And actually the approach that we took here, when we first approached keyword research for this site, we went in looking to answer the question on what do families want to know when planning a vacation? Now, before we even get into any tools, before we get into any data, we have to be in a position to know what are we trying to find here? What are we looking for? And in this instance, it was ultimately the, initially the topics that families cared about when planning the vacation. Fast track your keyword research by starting with competitor analysis. Now you can see here one of the competitors to this site that we were already aware of from sort of niche research when putting together the initial strategy for this site, a site called Family Destinations Guide. Now that site's driving about 2.5 million organic hits per month. And actually our analysis has shown us that in our opinion, the site structure was weak. There was a whole host of issues with that site, but actually that showed us that even with what we as a team of SEO experts concluded that was maybe room for huge opportunity, there was still great growth being driven. So we turned to SEMrush and first thing we looked at was what pages are driving the most traffic. And actually what we started to see here was a number of different trends. We can see actually that they, the top driving page with about 56,000 hits per month is their page on best hotels with indoor water parks. We also see best beaches, best things to do. Now, then going at keyword level, I'm a big, big fan of starting at page level because actually we're, we're more interested at topic level. And actually sort of topical level, we often see at page level. I mean, if, we, if I just quickly go back, we can see here that that top page is ranking for almost well, 2,400 keywords. So going at page level before query level, starts you off on the right track on okay where do we need to be thinking what do we need to be thinking about then diving into keywords we start to see the expansion of this with search volume with some of the opportunities 
So we distilled all this information, um, combination of sort of exporting from some rush to Google Sheets, cross-referencing with Ahrefs, with Google Keyword Planner, building up a seed keyword list. And what we were then left with was key topics. Now, starting with topic research is, as far as I'm concerned, a very, very smart move because it helps you to identify ways to scale. So if we look at what these were, the first of these was where to go. We had where to stay, what to do, and where to eat. When looking at answering the question on what do families planning a vacation care about? What content do they want to consume? We could group probably 70 to 80% of the traffic being driven to other sites in the sector into these four categories. So actually what we had here was a very, very top level framework to say, okay, if we can start to break this down, we have a strategy that we can start to scale. So we start with Google head to Google and we simply put in family resorts in and we can start to see from autocomplete recommendations. So we see Florida, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, Mexico. We start to see here actually what people are actually searching for. Again, we're not at numbers level yet. Here we are looking for sort of keyword templates. So in this instance, family resorts in. Then what do we do? We head to SEMrush and we add this into the keyword magic tool, family resorts in select the country. This returned 9,278 keyword variations based around this scalable template of family resorts in. And then in most instances, we're expecting a location of various other modifiers. 9,000 keywords is a hell of a lot to sort through. So, at this point, we turned to Keyword Insights, a very, very great tool that if you've never tried, I suggest you go and sign up for a free trial. This can save you an absolute ton of time. So the example, as a working example here, I took the top 500 keywords from that previous list of 9,000, ran this through Keyword Insights, and what this spits out is clustered topics. So it's grouping keyword variations based on what's ranking on the SERPs. So let's say family resorts in Florida, Florida family resorts. They're the same keyword, they're a variation. This allows us to group very, very quickly. So what this did was take 106 content pieces. It gave us 106 content pieces from 500 keywords. And you can see actually when we expand each cluster out, we can see all the different keywords that should be targeted for a single page. Now, this took about 10 minutes. So from start to finish, from putting in initial seed keyword, well, a variant of the keyword, the family resorts in, to SEMrush exporting the data, running it through Keyword Insights, in 10 minutes, we had 106 content pieces. Now, don't get me wrong, you then have to go and manually check over, make sure that the keyword targets make sense. But actually, once we replicate that across different keyword frameworks, we can very, very quickly see how you can start to build a content plan at hundreds, if not thousands of pieces of content very, very quickly, all with the data we need. So what we were really looking for here were trends in the keywords. And a few examples here, we had family resorts in location. We had family hotels in location. In many cases, they have a different intent depending on the location. <laughs> Things to do with kids in location. Attraction type. So let's say water parks in location. Location versus location. Once we have these trends of these different keyword types, we could very, very quickly start to build out a keyword plan, a content plan that allowed us to say, okay, how are we then going to group this? How are we going to approach this? Our decision on this site was to group by destination. So both state level and country level to group in that way. Very, very quickly, we could create, I think we started the site with just over a thousand pieces of content planned to give us a picture on what, you know, what does that bigger picture look like? You know, if we were saying we can create as much content as we want now, 
What would that look like? It means you can much more effectively plan and scale and say, okay, how much content can we produce? What do we need to be doing to build topical authority? But actually then it comes to producing what we sort of call better content briefs. So I'm a massive, massive believer that a solid content brief is probably one of the most important parts of the content creation process. And if we look at the purpose of a content brief, really what we're doing here is we're giving writers a list of requirements, recommendations, and pretty much everything they need to create best on the web content. It allows writers to focus on what they do best, writing, not necessarily planning and in-depth research, which is often more informed by data from tools. Let writers be creative. But actually, when we look at the reasons why briefs are so important, when you take the time to build out really, really solid briefs, you can ensure that the content that's produced goes into enough depth. Now, if a topic to perform, if a keyword you know, to perform on the SERPs needs 2,000 words to sufficiently answer that query, 500 words isn't going to cut it. But actually, we can use data, we can use tools to allow us to give this information to writers. We need to make sure that the content matches the intent of what's already ranking. If the first page of the SERPs is transactional content, category pages, product pages, it's very, very unlikely that you're going to rank an informational page, but the, the flip also exists. In some cases, it's mixed intent. You will see an intent where there is both transactional and informational content ranking, but you need to know what type of content you have to be creating. Make sure that content isn't missing any essential information. When it comes to positioning you as experts in the space, what do you need to be talking about? What's that sort of perfect content structure? And then it also allows you to bring sort of direction into on-page elements, word count, internal links, essentially everything that contributes to the success of that piece. Giving it from an SEO perspective, a content marketing perspective, and passing that information straight to a writer rather than leaving it to guesswork. So, to create content briefs, we use Surfer SEO, a fantastic tool, which ultimately allows you to analyze the SERPs to see, okay, actually, what are the topics, you know, what are the keywords being talked about? What are the headings that are being used? What are the outlines? So we build our briefs in Surfer, and ultimately, we're looking to use that insight from the content that's already ranking. But what I will say at this point is it's very, very important not to fall into a trap of creating copycat content. Now, copycat content um, is what I call the content that's created by going and looking at the first result on the search, the first two results, and almost just rewriting that almost section for section. You have to stop and think about what could make the content that's already performing at the top of the search better. It might be visuals, it might be data, it might be the overall page experience. But there has to be a starting point. And a starting point from a brief perspective is very, very scalable using tools such as Surfer, other alternatives, I think like Phrase, Market News, ClearScope, a whole host of different tools that all do very, very similar things. Our preference is Surfer. So what do you include in a brief? Well, as a very, very bare minimum, a great content brief should include the target word count, should include the target keyword or keywords and variants, essentially what should be covered, you know, what, what is this page actually targeting? The intent, what's the type of content that needs to be created? Is this a category page? Is it a long form informational guide? Give that information to a writer, don't make them guess. Proposed headings, I'm a big, big fan of SEOs providing a sort of outline structure to writers. Again, showcasing what actually should be the flow of that content, as well as notes within each section heading to the sort of things that should be covered. What should be talked about? What are the key facts, key bits of information? And of course, internal link recommendations. While some writers are sort of fully trained in SEO, actually, you know, it, this should be information that's provided, information that's given. And when you're able to do that, you will 
typically ensure that you know your internal linking structure that you've planned out very very carefully is replicated almost regardless of whether you use one writer two writers ten writers and then links to the top ranked content give writers an easy reference point for the content that's already performing on the SERPs. encourage them to go and read that give them that baseline of what essentially you, we need, you need to be producing better than and then coming on to site structure so site structure is something that's often talked about in a very simplistic way and i'm fully aware that here we have the luxury of planning this before the site launched but we chose to plan our site structure based on destinations the site this site targeting the u.s market primarily so we have state level within the u.s with significant search volume significant opportunities for content we grouped content at state level as well as country level for the likes of Canada. We included destinations such as the Caribbean as a grouping. Essentially, we were mapping the site structure out based on our keyword research. And there's a very, very sort of quick summary of what this actually looks like. Um, we often use Blue Maps free tool to plan out a site structure very, very early on. And you can see how we've grouped from home, we've grouped sort of to USA. Within that, we've grouped states, Florida, Hawaii, California. Within that, we have family resorts. We then, have, in Florida, as an example, then as a sub of that, we have family resorts in Orlando, Miami, etc. What I will say is that we did not silo the URLs beyond the destination. So the target content for family resorts in Orlando sits in forward slash Florida, forward slash family resorts in Orlando. We purposefully kept things sort of within a folder structure of the sort of key destination, even though Florida is, of course, located within the US. We wanted to keep the URLs as close to the route as possible, grouping sort of by that key destination. Given we're targeting the US, there's an awful lot of intent for US only vacations. But actually, I want to talk about this sort of common silo structure and actually sort of including a quote from Google's John Mueller. His recommendation is that the top down approach or pyramid structure actually helps Google to understand the context of individual pages. And if we take a look at that, this sort of historic sort of standard pyramid structure is very, very similar to what you've seen us roll out. Here are some sort of screen graphs that I took from AHREFs. Imagine that living room and dining room was Florida. Going beyond that sort of straight silo structure and understanding that there is absolutely nothing wrong with cross-linking between silos. That sort of legacy mindset of everything should be kept within a silo as far as I'm concerned, is broken. If there are opportunities, which I'm going to show you in a minute how we did that, to link between California and Florida, as an example, there are ways from a user experience perspective that you can do that. You absolutely should be doing so. Site structure is important to get right, but actually you can define site structure by more than just the sort of overall URL structure. You can also achieve that with internal linking. So we've planned our content. We've assumed we've had our content written by a writer, whether that's in-house, whether that's with a freelancer, with an outsourced team. Content optimization. So again, at this point, we jump back to Surfer. And actually, Surfer is great for building on those briefs. This is the same tool that we create the briefs in. We're now dropping that completed content in and saying, right, okay, how are we performing against other content that ranks at the top of the SERPs in terms of word count, the headings. Ultimately, we're using data to inform our approach to content optimization. But actually, going beyond that, I strongly encourage you to get your own sort of SOP, your standard operating procedure for publishing content. Here we have, it's a pretty standard checklist and a bit of a guide to a repeatable framework so we could pass that to almost anybody on the team whether it's a new team member whether it's somebody who's stepping into that and they will understand exactly what the process is for publishing and optimizing that content this includes things such as the page title page headings meta description internal linking categorization 
table of contents, internal links to and from. So when we publish a post, we'll of course internally link to other pieces of content when we publish that. But it's also really, really important to go back to content that's been published in the past and add internal links into that new piece of content. Again, really to help it rank faster, to help build that topical authority, show those topical connections. And then we get to probably the most interesting part of this, which is accelerated publishing velocity. Now, there's not a lot of givens in SEO. There's a lot of things that are uncertain. But one of the things that you are absolutely in total control of is the rate at which you publish content. Now, if we have a look at the sort of rate at which we publish content on this site, the site launched in August last year. And you can see month on month how the content that we publish in terms of word count and number of posts is scaled. So over those eight months, we've published an average of 208,000 words per month, which is 86 posts. In eight months, we've published 1.67 million words and we've published 688 posts. Looking at how that breaks down in sort of a cumulative approach, we can see that every month we're driving that increase in content that exists on the site. Now, what I will say is this is all great content. It passes our internal checklist. We're certainly not cutting corners. We're absolutely not using AI. This was achievable by scaling a team of, sort of freelance content writers. But it's a great demonstration and a great sort of showcase that when you invest in SEO, SEO should be an investment. And when you do that, you're able to rapidly scale results. And actually that sort of mindset that it's going to take six to 12 months to see results is actually often tied to the rates at which things are done. But there's one very, very important thing to take into account when publishing at velocity. And it's accepting that published is better than perfect. So often I see content that's sat in draft, in approval, being looked at by various different stakeholders for weeks on end. Until that content's published, it's not going to perform. Until it performs, though, very, very few people are actually likely to see that content. So publish and then improve, then optimize. If you have any final changes, images to add, get that content published. The sooner you do so, the sooner that content will perform. And then internal linking, something that's very, very, very important for building topical authority, for driving growth, and actually a tactic that actually never fails to drive quick wins. I just wanted to give you an example from a piece of content that we recently published. And this was the best places for zip lining in California on this site. In February, I think we published this in January, in February, that page, that sort of keyword actually the zip line california sat in position 22 on google us we added internal links from other posts and that shot up to position two on google in about a week that's the impact that strategic internal linking can have when you approach it with the mindset of adding internal links where it makes sense to do so so what does google say again coming back to a quote from john mueller we have to remember that internal linking is about more than passing page rank. I think sort of those who've been in SEO some time often refer to sort of internal linking as a way to pass page rank from one page to another. And whilst that is absolutely the case, page rank also passes contextual relevancy. Internal linking helps search engines to understand the topical connection between those pages, largely through anchor text and really understand how those pieces of content are connected. So on this site, we actually have a fairly sort of templated approach to internal linking, but one that ultimately works and drives growth. So breadcrumbs, I'm a big believer that pretty much every site should, should be using breadcrumbs, not necessarily as a, a straight up internal linking tactic, but actually to demonstrate that connection back to a parent category, of course, marked up with breadcrumb schema. So in this instance, we're 
always linking back to the parent's destination. Now, the reason we do that is actually quite strategic and on purpose, because when we're able to link back to the main sort of parent destination, we're doing two things. We're demonstrating that topical connection between that post and that location. But what we're also doing is we're passing page rank straight up to the category level. So any external links that we earn into those posts are then passing page rank straight up to the category level, the destination level, which is then further distributed to the newer pieces of content in that cluster. When we're able to do that, we're almost able to fast track that growth, help content get ranked faster, help content perform better because we're strategically passing page rank through the site. And then lastly, we're of course using in content linking, we're linking through to relevant content where it makes sense to do so. And where possible, if you remember a few minutes ago, I mentioned sort of cross-linking between silos. Now, here's an example of an internal linking block that we added to, I think this was family, uh, all-inclusive family resort in California. We were adding in recommendations to other all-inclusive resorts on the grounds that if someone's considering their options for resorts, they may well be interested in other destinations as well. So going beyond internal linking, just being for SEO and putting the user at the heart of your decisions. So the last part of the puzzle here is digital PR led link acquisition. Using PR tactics to earn links from some of the most authoritative sites in the sector. And to give a really quick run through of how we did this, we've actually launched three digital PR campaigns. The first one was a data study on the best US cities to visit with kids. This launched about a week after the site launched. We went very, very quickly in with PR-driven link building. The first link that we built to the site was timeout. We're sending authority signals, both contextually. So we've got links coming from content on the best cities to visit with kids, linking to the family vacation guide, days after the site launched. If that isn't an authority signal, then I don't know what is. But we also got really, really strategic. The first topic cluster that we built out on the site was Florida. So we actively targeted Florida Press, landing link coverage from Tampa Bay Business Journal, from the Miami Herald or Miami.com. We got really, really strategic on planning out where we wanted to be earning links from and utilizing a data study to allow us to do that. And the second campaign, this actually performed really, really well. We earned about 140 links to this. A simple piece, again, a data study, the US airports where your flight is most likely to be delayed or canceled. People care about this stuff. And when you can create content that people want to consume, publishers will cover it. They will link to it. And as you can see there, we were passing link authority back through to state level based on the airport. Some of the link coverage we earned here was travel and leisure, travel awaits, trip savvy, some really, really high authority travel publications, positioning the site as experts in that family travel space, in the travel industry, and building that authority. And the last campaign, 25 best ski resorts for families in the US. Again, this was launched to coincide with the start of the ski season and the launch of Topic Cluster on ski. Building links from Mental Floss, from Travel Daily, and regional publications such as Out There, Colorado. Getting really, really granular to earn links from within content that is perfectly aligned to the content we're trying to rank. So when we look at digital PR, links matter, but actually you need to be looking at how you can use digital PR and link acquisition tactics to position your team as experts and earn links as a result of this. Some of the ways to do this are data studies, expert insights and comments, reactive news checking. But again, stepping outside of link building and SEO for a moment, what this also allowed us to do was to build trust. As soon as we have this coverage in, we added a block to the website's homepage as seen in. This is building trust, this is building authority. And then just to very, very quickly finish off, just a couple of slides left. I can't stress enough the importance of continuous improvement. 
you're not finished with a post once you hit publish. There's often this mindset that once a piece of content is published, forget about it and move on to the next. Absolutely not. Every month, we run an opportunity analysis. We're looking to discover things like the keyword ranking in the bottom half of page one, top half of page two. This in turn opens up ideas around internal linking opportunities, content optimization opportunities, ideas for supporting content. How can we go back and help the content we've already created to work harder? Really on the mindset that until we are ranking at the very, very top of the search and driving as much traffic as possible, our job is not done. You can do this by either in tools such as SEMrush, Ahrefs, or in Google Search Console. Again, looking at the queries against impressions, click-through rate, average position, and clicks to identify these opportunities to make your content work harder. So to recap, before we hopefully have a few minutes for questions, what drives SEO success in 2022? It's a scalable strategy that helps you to build topical authority, Publishing content at scale, two, three, four posts a month for most businesses will not cut it. A well thought out approach to site structure and internal linking combined with building authority through link acquisition and PR. This approach can and does drive huge results. You can take a site from nothing to 300,000 sessions in eight months. Thanks very much for listening. Hopefully you found that useful and engaging. And yeah, I would love to take uh, any questions that we had come in very, very quickly for the last few minutes. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, James. It's, uh, it was really insightful. Uh, published Thank content you. is better than, than not published. Uh, absolutely, really absolutely. Um, there's one question by Anthony. Any quick tips yeah. on finding writers at scale? Finding, finding writers at scale, um, it can be a challenge. I think, you know, understanding that you're not going to find them in one place. So, I mean, as an example, we use a mix of in-house writers. We use a number of content agencies, um, word agents, my content pal, a couple of options out there. Splitting content to, you know, to create content at a scale, splitting that content creation across a pool of writers, finding freelancers, people per hour, Upwork. You need a process to vet those writers to make sure they are able to work to your briefs and deliver that quality. But actually spreading that content between multiple sources is probably the best way to scale that unless you have the luxury of a large team, which most people don't have. Interesting, okay. But I'll add to that. How do you find a, a, a writer and then they need to match, obviously, the tone of voice of the brand because yeah. so many articles, okay, Johnny or Alex might have written that. But if you look at brands like, um, uh, okay, Nike or Apple or the, yeah. the, yeah. you, you know that it's written by them. Um, what's the brand in the UK that we have, the smoothie brand? Um, Innocent. Which Innocent. Brand? Innocent, yeah, Innocent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like and if, I think that comes down to... Yeah. It comes down to my point on briefs. You know, when you have a solid brief, you should be able to deliver that brief to any writer and deliver content that is on brand in line with your goals and to, you know, so it, it comes across as your brand. Okay. Another question by Rafine. Would videos be counted as successful content or to have different styles of content? So, I mean, it depends on the goals. I mean, the bulk of what we do here is, you know, on this site in, in sort of certainly was around driving traffic from organic search. Video, it's, you can take a similar approach to keyword research around YouTube as an example. So YouTube is the world's second biggest search engine after Google. So again, understanding what, what people want to, you know, what do people want to consume? The, the sort of whole topical authority aspect isn't going to pass over to say YouTube as an example, you know, that's largely a, an SEO driven approach and mindset. Um, but again, aligning content on YouTube or other video platforms around what people are looking for is, is a way to scale that up. Using the same mentality for what, what you just talked about, just doing it on YouTube, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, yeah, you need to understand what, what sort of content the, the audience wants to consume.
Okay, thank you. Another question by Irmantas. Any quick tips for a B2B high-tech software development company that just has started yeah, implementing yeah. blogs in their website? Yeah, and I think, you know, regardless of whether it's B2B, whether it's B2C, ensure that you are creating blog content around a keyword strategy. Rather than going in with a mindset on what can we write about, anchor that to a keyword strategy, anchor that to keyword research, and you can ensure that there is actually people looking for that content. Okay, we have to speed up a bit because we don't have time. We have that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, does this strategy works with YouTube channel or streaming social media channels, Twitch? Um, I mean, I think we've yeah, I think we've answered that in the uh, yeah. in the previous question. I mean, you, YouTube to to a certain extent. Um, I I'm going to be honest. I am not an expert in channels such as Twitch. Um, I am a, I'm an SEO, not a video marketer. Um, so I'm afraid I can't answer that as well as I'd like to. Cool. Olga asks, I saw your screenshot that you have 93% of new users. Yeah. On what stage would should we think about growing the retention of, to the blog after one year or more? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I would say from day one. I mean, you know, we, you know, very, very quickly, maybe a few weeks from launch, um, launched uh, ways to drive users to a newsletter sign up. Um, we're engaging on social where, you know, there is sort of retargeting being added on that. I think for the first year of a site, you will expect a high percentage of new users. Um, but actually, as it, it's building a database. As you build that database, you should start to see that returning visitors increase and that new users percentage drop. Awesome. Petra asks, uh, what do you recommend is the best tactic to reach out companies, get digital PR? And we have to... It's to create, it's to create content that people care about newsworthy content um, spend time analyzing the news publications that you want to be featured in and create content that aligns that a journalist can't create themselves so data studies tools interactive assets are a really great way to do that okay and last question by emily translation agency or hire local writers to create their own version when working globally i would almost always go local writers if possible um, but again, it depends how the translation agency is set up. When sort of translating content, it's really, really important that you're translating based on the culture and, you know, localizing content as well as translating. Translation agencies don't always get that right. Um, and actually, work, you know, working with a pool of writers is preferential, but actually in some instances at scale, that has to be done on a translation agency. I think it depends what the market is. And again, vetting the translation agencies to understand how are they how are they sort of sourcing their translators? Are they local? Are they native? Or are they, you know, sort of just, you know, those who are fluent in that language? Awesome. James, thank you so much for sharing. No problem at all. Thank ideas. you for having me. I highly recommend you, you connect with James on LinkedIn, ask him any other questions you might have. Yeah, feel free to reach um, and uh, yeah, the rest, guys, thank you so much for joining this session. And we are Thanks off to much. the next session. Thank you, James. Bye, Thanks guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.